All right, Matt, back with Fight Night Picks, Perry, and Counter. Listen, we've been having a lot of fun with yeah. this new segment, two Fight Night Picks. And yeah, it's a little bit of a substitution to the Fight Picks, which I know a lot of people are familiar with, and that's probably why you're here today. But we have no fights to pick. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in MMA news, but this is one of those things that we're going to keep up with no matter what. Whether there's fights to pick or not, we really enjoy the fan questions. So make sure, whether it's under this video or under some of the other videos, make sure you throw out your questions 100%. for us. And today, one of the questions that we've kind of spun a little bit because we've done this in the past, and that's where we're going to go with it, is from Lee Morey. And he says, hey guys, is there any chance you'll do a video in the future uh, of future champs and or number one, number two contenders for each division in three years. If not, I'm sure that's a long analysis, LOL. Now, Lee threw it out there in terms of champions in the next couple of years. We kind of went back and forth in a couple of the comments and said, um, one of the things that we did last summer with Fight Night Picks was when we were doing this week in MMA, which we're still doing at times. When there's MMA. When there's MMA. But um, one of the things that we did was a full deep dive into Dana White's Contender Series. We did Season 1, Season 2, and Season 3 hadn't totally wrapped up yet, so we didn't really get into it. So what we're going to do today is we're going to throw it over to that episode, and it was an old segment from the show called Round Number 1, where same idea, fan questions. We actually had a friend of the show, Max Friedman, ask us a question in video format, which you'll see coming up. And then we're going to go through every single season. And what we're going to do today is we're going to provide an update. So we'll go through season one, season two, and then we're season three, where we didn't have a whole lot to say on it. What we're going to do is we're going to go through the third season, talk about some of the people that did get contracts and maybe some of the ceilings there, as well as, you know, the possibility that we see some of these fighters from the contender series contending for titles or at least a shot at the top 15 in their respective divisions. So Matt, I'm looking forward to this yeah, so because much. we've seen a lot of different fighters come out of Dana White's Contender Series where it's more of an amalgamation of the best of the best of regional talent, not so much not so much like the I Ultimate got, Fighter where my, you know okay. you'd see you'd see some fighters with you know like a two and one record though. coming. I in. think the Ultimate Fighter is by far the worst show, but I think it's a lot better to actually have good fighters in the UFC because and we're gonna go back. I was off on so many of these uh, different people from the Contender Series because it, you can't just go by one fight. It's really easy to look good in one fight, and then you know we don't really know where to go after that. And these fighters are so hyped up. So for as a method of farming new talent, I actually think the Ultimate Fighter is quite a bit better. But for entertainment wise and what makes a better show, uh, a Contender Series is so much better. All right, so. So what we'll do is we're going to dive into the question. Uh, the other thing, we had some video clips that we popped up. We just threw up the old Fight Night Picks picture over top of them. So that's why it's like that. But let's get into Max Friedman's question, the first season, and then we'll pop back in to offer. The All right, Matt. So we are back at it again with we round are. number one. And friend of the program, at Trademark MMA, you can find him there on Twitter, Max Friedman. He hosts a weekly uh, breakdown show with Marcel Dorf of MMA DNA. Listen, one of the greatest guys in MMA oh, yeah. media. But Max does a great job as well. And it's a good show that they host on Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network. You can find me there in between the links every Monday night. It's a video show now. And our producer, John Franklin, is doing one hell of a job. It's a really cool yeah, show. Kill it. Hopefully we can see Matt on there shortly. But round number one, the focus of it is you can send in a question you'd like us to answer. So Matt, without further ado, let's hear what Max has to say. Sounds good. What's up, Alan Bros? MMA, got a question for you. Dana White's Contender Series, a lot of contracts have been going out. Do you think some of these talents are going to go far in the organization? If so, which ones are bound for success? Love to hear your thought. All right, Matt, so, we're going to swap screens really quick, exactly. and we'll get into our answer. All right, Matt, so round number one. So we heard our question from Max here a second ago, and what we've been doing with these podcasts is if you want to watch the entire thing, you can in one block here on YouTube, and I'll timestamp it so you can check out all the different segments. But hey, if you're only in it for round number one and you want to hear a fan question answer, maybe you're Max Friedman and you just want to hear our answer. We're breaking them out as separate videos, but the big thing with round number one we're not just going to scratch the surface with these no, questions. We're going to get deep and in depth. These aren't like the two minute breakdowns where we only get two minutes. We really get into it. And if you want to head back into previous episodes, listen, we've done a snake draft style uh, heavyweight, heavyweight Grand Prix tournament. tournament. Yeah. We've done Mount Rushmore of MMA. So we've had a lot of fun with these questions and we really do appreciate them. So the, the question that Max asked, it's, it's kind of tough because you could look at it as this year. This year of Dana White's Contender Series, it's like, let's sign whoever we can that has a pulse. Okay. And let's not sign one really good fighter that everybody's disappointed. We'll talk about that. And it happened in season two as well. 
Um, but it's something that's been thrown out there quite a bit. And you look on Twitter to, uh, today or in the last 20 hours or so, Luke Thomas, I mean, one of the best guys out exactly. there with Showtime, says, I've watched every week Contender Series this season and seen very little UFC-ready talent or otherwise standout fighters. I don't know if I'm romanticizing the past, but I don't remember other seasons being like this. And it, it does kind of feel a little watered down. You go into this season, you look at the records. I mean, there's a fair amount of fighters with under 10 pro fights. Yeah, exactly. I know... For example, a fighter that uh, that might come up on our list, he does come up on our list, has less than five fights. And I know Cyril Gagne is fighting this weekend. He's 3-0, and but he's kind of like an anomaly. Exactly. But this season just doesn't feel the same as it does in previous seasons. So how, what are some other ways that we could break this question down? Well, when you look at it, you do kind of have to do that separation of the season three guys, which is going on right now, and the guys from season one who have already had a chance to get, you know, two, three, four fights in the UFC. Because there is, it really seems like this season, as long as you win, and if you get a finish, you probably get signed. It doesn't matter how lackluster the fight was. If you knock the guy out in the last second, you're probably getting a contract. We've seen multiple episodes this year of two, three, four, five guys all getting signed in the same episode, which is really unusual because it really kind of felt more special when in the first season, it was like, we might get four finishes out of five fights. And it was, oh, who's that one person who's going to get signed? Like there was kind of that... It was just, it felt a lot more special, that was all. And now it's just, like you said, anyone who has a pulse, and if you win your fight, you're probably going to get signed. You go back to the first two seasons, even. There's so much regional talent in the States and exactly. abroad, especially with the Brazilian season. Um, you just, you look at it and you had, you know, LFA champs, King of the Cage, CS, uh, Cage Titans. But yeah, all sorts of, like an amalgamation of all sorts exactly. of different organizations. The best fighters fighting for contracts. Now the talent pool settled a little bit, and and it's just it it isn't what it used to be. It's but. kind of getting into the trend of the Ultimate Fighter. Like the first so many seasons was great, and then kind of the more you go, you just kind of get locked into your trends, and it just become more watered down. So what we did was we went through season one, two, and three. We picked out all sorts of great fighters because the question really is who's going to find that success factor in the UFC? And again, success could be measured in all sorts exactly. of different ways. Are they drawing? Are they winning? Are they having exciting fights? It could mean all sorts of different things to different people. To me, winning, winning is definitely a major component of it. I don't think any of these fighters here are going to win a title in 2019, oh, no. possibly even 2020. But there's a lot of fighters on here that have, well, obviously everybody has exactly. title aspirations. But realistically... There's some guys who are definitely on the right track, though, and definitely yeah. going in that direction. Like, we're going to bring up Ian Heinish. Well, I guess we're bringing him up right now. But, but see, let's, let's start, we'll exactly. start, start, we'll with, start season with season one. So season one... We're going to go through season one. We're going to go with our honorable mentions to start because there's all there were all sorts of contracts. It was a really special season. Charles Bird's one of my honorable mentions, one of those guys at Fortis MMA that's really just been doing the damn thing. And you see the, the, the team there, they've been doing a great job, which, you know, listen, there's, there's even more Fortis guys on this list, so I won't talk about them too much. Of course, last weekend you saw a guy with Iron Nuts and Kennedy and Shukwu. Just really eating it and taking it for the team. But Certainly did. realistically, Fortis MMA, they're doing a great job there. So if we get into our five, now these are in no particular order. No. We'll just go name by name and, and we'll mention them. So first one that comes on my list is Sean O'Malley. He's 2-0 in the UFC. Listen, the fight that he had against Andre Sukumtoth was a fun one. I'm surprised that he won the fight, quite honestly. I'm surprised the referee didn't end the fight because... The ankle injury seemed to be one where you're hobbling that bad. You think the, the, the referee... Have just took him down, though, so it's not like you really had to balance on you'd it. You'd think the referee would bring in the doctor, maybe have a look ah. at it, but they decided not to. But Sean O'Malley's on my list because even at 2-0 and and even with the USADA issues, there's still a bright future for him. And I know recently I posted an article on Reddit um, from the Body Lock MMA, and they were talking about Sean O'Malley wants to come back fairly soon. And holy crow people upset about sean o'malley and there's a lot of different takes about him but matt what do you think about him i mean ceiling's high but why do you think he makes this list he he definitely makes this list and he's definitely the first person we bring up due to the fact that he is winning fights or i guess he was before he kind of had you know the foot injury and then the usada issues but he did seem to be that first guy who kind of had the x factor going into the ufc he has a very fun fighting style he has a unique personality and he's one of those guys like he doesn't just blend into kind of the rest of the roster because there are some guys who it's just like oh that's a person 
person. But Sean O'Malley, he has the tattoos, he's got the hair, he's got a really unique personality. He plays games, he markets exactly. himself well. He's very much just like a really stere- an extremely stereotyped millennial who's also really good at fighting. But with the USADA thing, that does kind of hold him back to the fact that we really don't know when the next time we're going to see Sean O'Malley. He was suspended the first time, and then served the suspension, was going to come back into Chito Vera, which would have been an amazing fight. And then, since there was kind of remnants of that uh, same metabolite i guess from the first time they wouldn't allow him to compete so it's gonna be one of those kind of weird situations where are they going to wait till his system's completely clean or are they kind of going to do sort of the john jones thing where they kind of let him fight but not really so yeah, and i doubt they move an entire pay-per-view for exactly him, but he's on the list nonetheless as one of those fighters that you definitely have to watch and i'm gonna go with another fighter here that has blown the doors off of an entire division yeah. he looks like one of those guys that could really make a move in jeff neal matt Jeff Neal is one so of those guys on that can he can finish a fight, he can fight a technical smart fight and win a decision like we saw against Bilal Muhammad. I mean, why does he make your list? Well, Jeff Neal, for me, if I know we're not really putting these guys in And another rankings. Fortis MMA guy, exactly. too. Exactly. I know we're not really putting these guys into rankings, but he would kind of be like my number one star out of this whole thing. When you think of Jeff Neal, you think he's one of the more technical strikers at 170 and one of the deepest divisions in the UFC. I mean, we just saw, what, last weekend when he fought Nico Price. It was a phenomenal fight. And, and that was, was a fight that, not tooting horns, but it was, it was fight of the night, performance of the night type material. We had said it. Exactly. A lot of people said it, but... Man, that fight delivered, and it Jeff real, Neal delivered. And the good thing about that fight, too, was we finally got to see Jeff Neal face some adversity. I mean, all of his UFC fights up until that point, I know the Muhammad fight did go to the decision. But Drew him out, but you got to see a lot of positives. Exactly, of and in the Muhammad fight, he kind of just beat the brakes off him. And we saw him face a little bit of adversity, but that was more just like, can he get the takedown, can he defend it, and whatnot. But in this uh, Nico Price fight, I mean, he dropped Nico, Nico hurt him, and it was really back and forth for the whole time. And I feel like, as a ceiling, just by wins go, not really his markability, just through the fact that I don't really know if Jeff Neil has that big it factor but he's definitely on the right track to get into that top 15 top 10 top 5 category. yeah and i mean like you can see on the screen as far as those walter reed rankings are concerned you've got luke Hayes fighting this weekend you've got DeSantos who has a fight coming up in china you've got neil magny who we haven't seen in quite a while i'd like to see jeff neil neil magny i think it's a terrible fight if you're a neil magny fan but and, it's definitely a good fight to get him into that top 15. yeah and i mean you've got damian Maya who's got a fight coming up with ben Askren. so i mean there there are fights that are taken up there but jeff neil magny that'd be a fun fight it would this is a guy that yeah, he's just looked really good since he's came into the UFC. Uh, a big boost off the Contender Series. And then for my next fighter, it's a guy who's already had five fights in the UFC. And I'll just pull one up here just so you can see it. I mean, Dana White had to say sign that man. And that doesn't even have to be from this year. It's no. just the fact that, listen, this guy's fought really, really well. That is Dan Ige. I mean, Matt, Dan Ige, I mean, yeah, he lost his first UFC fight against Julio Arce. Had the opportunity to be there live and in person, but... Man, Dan Ige just doesn't put on a boring fight. No, exactly. He has that real fight of the night friendly style where he's going to go out there. If you want to grapple, he's going to try to outgrapple you. If you're going to strike, he's probably going to outstrike you. Like, he's got a very multifaceted game. And he looks to be. That's kind of the problem with a lot of these Tuesday night contenders, guys. They're getting signed sort of too early in their career where they don't have time to sort of even out their skill set. But Dan Ige, he seems to, you know, he has. A very well-rounded game as it is so it's not like he has to work on a lot of different things to kind and of move up the ladder we've seen some fighters from previous seasons of contender series i'm thinking chase hooper i'm thinking greg hardy bavon lewis they've signed them to development deals some of them they brought back and had further fights and uh you know in the case of chase hooper he's continued to fight with island fights but regardless there's some fighters that yeah maybe from season three it would have made more sense to give him development deals but listen you got to sign somebody you can't not sign anybody but season one was just so chock full of talent that dan ige is on our list one of the other guys that's on our list a guy who listen he fought in contender series then he had to have a few fights away fight your favor then he fought your eye favorites ricky simone matt gave it up but <laughs> realistically your eye or uh ricky simone had the fight in Contender Series, got the win. Had to have two more fights in LFA. Of course, he was a champ over there. Exactly. And then he comes into the UFC and, I mean, won three fights before he did lose that fight to Faber. And, of course, he had that really controversial win over Marab Duashvili. But Ricky Simone is a guy, and listen, it's not because we picked him recently, but he's, what, 15-2 now? Yeah, beat one of Craig's favorite fighters of all time and Ronnie Yaya. Yeah, oh, Ronnie Yaya. But realistically, Ricky Simone's one of those guys that's multifaceted enough that he exactly. could still... Maybe not make a title run. Maybe. You don't know. It's still early. He's still a really young exactly. guy. Losing to a guy like Uriah Faber that early in your career, if anything, it should be a positive for yep. him because I know in the Marab fight, he did find a little bit of adversity, but he still got away with the win. To get a loss and have it kind of be that devastating and on definitely the biggest stage of his career, it's probably going to push him forward and help him, you know, in the long term. Yeah. So he's one of those guys. And then rounding out our five for season number one, 
Carl Roberson, I mean, yeah, he's 3-2 and two in the UFC, but you look at the fights that he's had, he's fought legit competition. Yeah. And, I mean, you go back to the Jack Marshman win, Beat what a performance. Up. And that was one that I didn't think it made sense to have the fight where it was. Yeah, it but, was on the main card. Yeah, it was on the main card of a pay-per-view. Yeah, it was weird. But it was a good performance by him. Before that, you know, he fought Cesar Mutante, uh, Fajaya, in what was a prelim, kind of like a feeder for a pay-per-view, which I thought was a really weird kind of option yeah, to go has, with um, in, in the other... spot that it was but carl roberson's one of those guys at 185 that you never know i mean he still could go on a run he reminds me of curtis millinder only a bigger version of him if yeah. the fight stays on the feet carl roberson's gonna be able to beat a lot of guys but the second it goes to the ground he's one of these guys who if they put him on a development deal give him like two or three more fights just not even for the fight experience just for the time to kind of you know get more skills definitely work on his grappling he would have been a lot better for, to be brought into ufc after that because we just see now he's this phenomenal striker but he has one huge weakness and he's kind of holding him back right now yeah and i totally understand that so that rounds out season one so all right so matt season one of dana white's contender series when it was dana white's contender series not dwcs stylized that way listen we did get a lot of talent into the ufc from that season and one of the knocks on dana white's contender series in the third season was the fact that maybe they didn't sign as many people as they did in the first two yeah. But with season one, and I know we talked about it in the video, there's a couple of different contenders that have probably emerged from that oh, season. Yeah. And I would say probably the biggest shining star is Sugar Sean O'Malley. And this is a guy that he was forced out. Now, when we talked about it in August, that USADA issue, it was kind of up in limbo. It was. Now, totally clear to both of the infractions that he had. So no wrongdoing. He comes back in in 2020 Holy and looks goodness. phenomenal. Yeah. He looks phenomenal. Now, Matt... In terms of his ceiling for Sean O'Malley, it's tough to say because this is a guy that doesn't have a lot of pro fights. Exactly. He's still a young guy. But in terms of technique, both on the feet and on the ground, this guy has a high ceiling. You're forgetting a third thing. And on the mic. And that's what people care about a lot, too. You're 100% right, though. And we say it a lot. Excitement plays a lot more into your ranking than wins and losses. And I think that's been shown time and time again. If you want to say the rankings are broken, we agree they are. But if you want to go up in the rankings, be exciting and be popular. Because they the UFC themselves kind of boost you to the top. So with just that promotional push, Sean O'Malley's only really two or three fights away from getting into the top ten. Because there's some people who, they have to fight backwards quite often where you might be the number 10th guy, but you're going to fight the 13th guy and then maybe the 9th guy and then the 11th guy. Sean O'Malley, they're not going to match make him that way. He's a big enough star that he's only ever going to be fighting ahead in the rankings. And I think that's smart because he took, what, two years off before his last fight, came yeah. back, looked better than ever, had vicious knockout power. I don't even know if he got hit once. Maybe he did one time. But a uh, flawless performance. So if he can keep on making those improvements like we've seen as of late, he's by far my number one prospect, if you will, to come off of Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series. But I think that there are other fighters who I have a bit better idea as to, like, you know, what their future holds than Sean O'Malley. So if we go off of, we'll go week by week and just talk about some of the people that have had a shot in the UFC. In week one, you had Kurt Holabaugh, Matt Bissett, both those guys getting a shot in the UFC. You had Zhu Anyanwu taking on Greg Rebello and Zhu Anyanwu right now in uh, Bellator. Greg Rebello, of course, still a CES. You had Boston Solomon getting a chance with the UFC Charles Bird and Joby Sanchez back in the UFC. So that was the first episode. Then the next one, you had Sean O'Malley getting a win over Alfred Kashakian, who you might have seen take on Sergio Pettis in Bellator. Went the same way as the Sean O'Malley fight did for him in Bellator. You also had Casey Kenny, Sydney Outlaw, who you might recognize again from Bellator. Uh, that's going to be a theme because Bellator has signed quite oh, a yeah. few of these guys I'm from the contenders. Pretty sure series. Bellator just waits outside the UFC Apex facility. Just whoever loses their hand in contracts out. Week three, we had Carl Roberson, Kyle Stewart, uh, Jeff Neal, Alonzo Menafield, Dan Ige, a lot of different fighters, as well as Ryan Spann in that episode. So maybe one of the episodes where. We had the most, uh, you know, future UFC talent that was brought in. And some of these guys have made a good impact. Now, I want to focus just quickly on two of those names. We talked quite a bit about Jeff Neal in the original episode. Dan Ige as well. These two guys are movers and shakers right now finisher. at 145 and at 185. And I know in our video where we did State of the Featherweights, Dan Ige was one of the guys that we focused on that's starting to make an impact, getting closer and closer to the top 15. But let's take a second for Jeff Neal because right now... He looks to be unstoppable. Yeah, I, that's the best way you can say it. Jeff Neal, they keep on giving him these brawlers, and he keeps on knocking them all out because technically he's just so crisp. And uh, the Mike Perry fight is just a really good example because Mike Perry, we know that technically he's not the most advanced striker, but when he hits you, you tend to fall down. And the way that Jeff Neal was able to go in there, land straight shots, stay calm, hit him with a head kick, it was just a perfect performance. And we've seen Jeff Neal every single time he fights... I, 
the first two times I think he fought, he was still working at the Cheesecake Factory as a waiter. So the fact that he was still able to get in his UFC training camps, come in, and then knock out a bunch of fighters is pretty impressive. And he's the guy, I, I'm kind of referring to Jeff Neal when I say that there's fighters out there who have a better idea as to what their future look like looks like. Because Sean O'Malley, for as much potential as he has, his skill set's still somewhat developing. Jeff Neal, he's of course getting better every fight, but I know what I'm going to get from Jeff Neal. He's going to go out there and he's going to put on a Muay Thai clinic for the most part. He's going to throw really good leg kicks, really good straight left, really good high kicks. And I see him as getting into the top 10. I don't know if Jeff Neal's ever going to be a champion though. And it's just due more to the weight class that he's in because welterweight, uh, it's just full of wrestlers. And that's the one kryptonite, if you will, that we've kind of seen from him. Nico Price is able to take him down. So if Nico Price is able to take you down, I'm pretty sure Kamaru Usman would be able to as well. But Jeff Neal, personally, I think he's going to get a main event first. If anyone who's on Dana White Tuesday Night Contenders, I think he's going to get a fight night main event at the least before anyone else does. So that'll be his first kind of landmark as a Tuesday Night Contenders alumni. And so we talked about it. Like this third week where you had Roberson, Span, Stewart, Neal, Menafield, Ige... There's one other guy that I want to focus on from this episode. It's a guy in the co-main event that lost due to an ankle injury, and he had a good first round. In the second round, it was a wonky kick. Like, I think it was from the first it round, was. and then in the second round, it just kind of was yeah. to his detriment. Jason Jackson, Titan FC champion. I, If I'm not mistaken, LFA welterweight champion as well. He's fighting in Bellator right now. I think his ceiling's pretty darn high. I do too. If he was a UFC fighter or with Bellator, you know how they say it, and I, I hate this, and I actually got a lot of flack on uh, Facebook when I posted our Bellator versus UFC uh, champ versus champ episode. A lot of people said, Bellator sucks. The UFC is the best. None of these Bellator guys, and listen, like in, in terms of championship material, you have to go through a lot harder of a road in the UFC than you do in Bellator, typically. Exactly. Typically. But Jason Jackson's one of those guys that whether or not he was in the UFC or Bellator or whatever organization, he's a darn good fighter. He's He is darn good. I wouldn't say he's great, though. He reminds me a little bit of kind of a knockoff Jeff Neal. He's a really good striker, really rangy, too. Big for the weight class. He's kind of built like me. like just Good takedown defense good is take one thing, defense, too. But not only that, good at getting back up to his feet once he is taken down. And we saw in the Ed Ruth fight in Bellator, we're, we know a lot about Ed Ruth over here. Uh, Ed Ruth won on the judges scorecards but jason jackson put on a performance dropped him uh at least one time could have been multiple times but his striking is really good so if you're a bellator fan for watching bellator make sure you tune in when he's fighting so week four this is a week where we had a lot of names and some people that were brought into the ufc in the main event you had julian marquez knocking out phil haas we haven't seen julian marquez in about two Hot years man. Kyler Phillips over James Gray. The important thing there, Kyler Phillips didn't get a contract, and then he was brought on, and he fought on uh, the Ultimate Fighter undefeated. You know, th that was a season where he fought quite well, and then they didn't sign him to the UFC, and then you finally just saw him making his UFC debut. Um, he was originally booked last year to face Ray Borg, but he came in uh, this season and looked very good in his first performance. And that's not to say that he's a contender. It's just the fact that, he had a weird winding road to get there, and he looked good in his debut. He also had uh, Brandon Davis take on Austin Arnett. Both of those guys ended up in the UFC. Brandon Davis had quite a few fights in the UFC before getting cut um, in the last, I want to say, four or five months here. Um, but that was one of those ones where... Very exciting episode, but I don't think there's that high of a ceiling on any no, of those guys. Kind of to my previous point, that's my one kind of gripe with Contender Series. One fight's not enough to get signed to the UFC off of, I don't think. And I'm sure the matchmakers are pretty familiar with everyone that they're putting on the show in the first place. But still, just have that one fight under the UFC pressure, if you will. Because I'm sure it would feel quite a bit different, even though you're just fighting at that Apex facility. All right, but. so Matt, week five of Contender Series. And out of that whole season, we had quite a few different weeks. We actually had eight. But in the fifth week, again, it was one of those ones where they almost top loaded it in the fifth week we had mike rodriguez julio arce alex perez and ricky simone i think ricky simone out of that episode was the more well-known fighter he was a two division champ over in lfa and he made maybe not an immediate impact but at least they got him onto the scene quite quickly um in terms of contenders i wouldn't say maybe there's much Four contenders from that week. I know Julio Arce's had some pretty decent fights, and Alex Perez at 125 pounds. I mean, you just saw him fight Jordan Espinosa here in 2020. I, I mean, he's ranked out of any of these fighters, but yeah, it's one of those weeks where it's it's not as top. No, one. exactly. You're not going to see. Well, uh, Ricky Simone was in the top 15 for a short period of time. At least we might see him back in there, but I don't really think Ricky Simone's a title challenger, in, even in the near future. So I, yeah, I wouldn't really put any of those guys in my watch list right now. You move forward to week six, and this is where it got interesting because we already did have one of these fighters competing in the first week. He pops back into the sixth week. I'm talking about Charles Bird and then finally 
Finally, he got a contract after week six. He also had Grant Dawson in the co-main event against Adrian Diaz. And Matt, Grant Dawson, I think the future at 145 is probably over for him. But at 155 pounds, do you see him making impact? This is a guy that has great jiu-jitsu. Yeah, he's a small Gregor Gillespie. That's exactly what he is. Grant Dawson... We see him at 145, just how good and how dominant he is. Can't make weight, though, so we just can't fight there. At 155, the only question I have is, will his skill set translate as well, being the smaller guy? Because if you're a really grappling heavy fighter, you always want to be the bigger guy, just because it's weird. You always think the bigger guy has the advantage. In grappling, yes. In boxing, for instance, it's not. Like, when a guy, there's a reason you can become a nine different weight class world champion in boxing, because the size doesn't matter as much. But when it's grappling and you have to carry that extra weight on top of you, it's just, it's so exhausting for your opponent. And at 155, Grant Dawson's going to just be another guy size-wise. He's not going to be one of the bigger guys. So he'll have good success, I think. But I don't think his ceiling is nearly as high at 155 as it would be at 145. Just as long as the career trajectory and the weight trajectory doesn't go the main Bermudez wrote maybe it goes more like the Anthony Johnson where he's actually able to gain some size and actually have a size well, advantage Rumble the difference though is Rumble had like God given knockout power and there was nothing any like weight classes didn't really matter for him he's one of the few fighters Grant Dawson needs to be able to get a hold of you and drag you to the ground and if he's fighting bigger guys that's gonna be harder and harder and harder for him to do so I worry a little bit about him fighting at 155 hopefully he could get if he could get his weight under control and be a 145er then I do think he'd be in the top 15 I think he'd be in the top 15 relatively soon but at lightweight guys Guys like Kevin Lee are going, what, one and four in their last five? Like, that's how hard the weight division is. So, Grant Dawson, for as good as he is, I just don't know if it'll translate up a weight class. So, that was week number six. Week number seven, again, it's one of those weeks where we had some people making the UFC. I mean, if I go over them, Kennedy and Shekwu taking on Anton Burzin. Of course, you get and Shekwu in the UFC. You get Benito Lopez and Steven Peterson in the UFC. You get Joby Sanchez in the UFC. You get Mike Santiago and Jordan Espinosa. So, we had a lot of people we sign. Did. In terms of high ceilings, I wouldn't say so much. I mean... One of the neat people that actually got finished in that season was uh, J.P. Buys, who lost to Joby Sanchez. Him and his wife, Cheyenne, are both uh, competing with LFA, so some neat stuff there. Out of one of the bigger gyms in uh, MMA right now, and I know we talked about that in that round number one segment of Fortis MMA, um, and it was interesting because Cheyenne Buys actually followed or, or cornered Bia Malecki on that Brasilia card. She was her only corner getting the win there over Veronica Macedo. Now, just totally going a different way, week number eight, we had... Um, one of the bigger weeks because we had Casey Kenny originally, uh, earlier on in that season and yeah, he lost his fight here, but we'll see him back again, um, and end up in the UFC. You had Matt Frivola, Bavon Lewis also getting contracts. You had Lauren Mueller and Alan Crowder, uh, who beat Dante Mays. He ended up in the UFC as well. Go watch his fight with Cyril gone. If you want to see a contender now. So that's our first season of Dana White's contender series, Matt. That's one of those seasons where, again, we probably have two guys, two guys out of everybody on eight weeks that probably have maybe not title aspirations, but at least top 10 talent. If you could rank season one out of the three seasons, where would you put it? Uh, It's probably the third, mainly because they tried to force Uriah Uriah Faber and Snoop Dogg doing commentary down everyone's throat. People liked it. It wasn't good, though, if you actually like the sport. So, uh, the good thing, though, it brought Paul Felder to us. He started doing commentary during season one, and I really enjoyed him. Brendan Fitzgerald, he was brought to us. So, these are the positives so far from season one of Dana White's Season Night Contenders. I like how probably their two biggest stars were on this season, though. Sean O'Malley and Jeff Neal, regardless of what season, we're going to speak the highest of them compared to pretty much anyone else. Just due to the fact that, like, you're going to have guys, even in week one of season two, Kevin Hall and Greg Hardy, guys who are recognizable in the UFC, but no one near the level of talent that a Jeff Neal or a Sean O'Malley. Has. All right, so let's kind of switch it back. We'll go back to last summer. We'll hear our analysis on the second season, and then we'll provide you an update on season one. So season two, which you had last summer, of course, you had two different iterations. You had Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series season two. You had Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series Brazil. No and Snoop Dogg on either one of them. No, and listen, the Brazilian season had a lot of really good fighters. Obviously, one super fighter who, listen, I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. The, the biggest star for the Brazilian series, and if you don't remember anyone else from that season, Johnny Walker has to be the standalone one. breakout star. All of it. You could say Johnny Walker's the biggest star of Dana White's Contender Series, do. and everybody's right. going to think, he fought on Contender Series? He did. It was at the end of the season on the Brazilian season, but 
Listen, Johnny Walker with the recently announced Corey Anderson fight that you were talking about. He beats Corey Anderson. He gets a title shot. And if you listen to the conversation that he had with Pete Carroll on Eurobash this week, listen, it was an awesome one because he's been training at SBG, his full training camp, which it's not going to be that long, but it's going to be in Russia. And Pete asked him, is he going to come out with the Russian colors? And he said, yeah, sure. I, why not? I'd love to represent Ireland as well. That was another one of the questions. But So he's the new Russian hammer? Well, I'll just train wherever. And Johnny Walker is he's so charismatic. His fights are so much fun. He injures himself in his cellies. <laughs> the, guy's, the guy's a lot of fun. So Johnny Walker, of course, encompasses everything. Exactly. So that that's pretty much all you really need to say about the Brazilian series. But if you look at just Dana White's contender series as a whole, and the reason why I'm doing this is because not that, that it's vague, but to tie into season three. So you look at season two, the first guy that I really look at and a guy that listen, I mean, he's a finisher. He fights really smart. You can tell that fight IQs there is super Sadiq Yusuf. He's already two and zero in the UFC, put on a great performance on the contender series. And he's one of those guys, again, incredibly charismatic Nigerian MMA is it's without a, a doubt on the map. And this is one of those guys that's really pushing it. Sadiq Yusuf too. You look at the fight that he had in Australia. He beat one of the Anzac fighters as exactly. well. And one of the Mokhtarians. So Sadiq Yusuf for me is one of those breakout stars of season two. Exactly. And we haven't really seen him as much as we've seen sort of other guys from that same season. Even it's just, you can tell that his skill set's one of the more UFC ready. I mean, yep. for instance, when you watch, cause I'm a big basketball fan. When you watch the NBA draft, sometimes they'll say this guy was really good at college, but his game doesn't really translate all that well to the NBA. Sadiq Yusuf is one of those guys who his skills definitely translate well into the big leagues. Yeah, exactly. So Sadiq Yusuf, one of those guys that's really, really done well for himself here coming out of season two, another one of those fighters that listen incredible life story uh, insane a great article Channing on, Tatum might play him in a movie yeah on uh the Players Tribune Ian Heinish a guy at middleweight that they put him up against a couple of tough tests fight Derek Brunson soon and I mean listen he fought shoe face he got in a couple of really tricky great spots fight. able to get the win there Mutante able to get the win there yeah. as well and yeah I mean the fights just keep getting bigger and bigger but this is one of those guys coming in from LFA that it was like he was primed for success there. I had a feeling watching the regional promotion that, listen, this is one of those guys that was going to make an immediate impact. But this is a fighter that, like, not just MMA people are talking about him, which is always good for exactly. the sport. And I think his ceiling's really high at middleweight. So do I. I mean, you look at his skills. He's fought two primary grapplers, even though that's not really his strength. And he's done extremely well neutralizing their game plans. I know he his has... His defensive to... wrestling's really no, good. It's really amazing. Good. I mean, when you saw, like, the rolls that he used to get out of uh, Shoe Face's kind of takedown attempts... They were spooky. Yeah, it was <laughs> insane. And him fighting Derek Brunson next... I mean, Derek Brunson is kind of the stereotypical gatekeeper of a division... But he's a very dangerous one at that. I mean, I know he had that terrible fight with Elias in his last one, and not to make this all about Derek Brunson, but if you beat Derek Brunson, it's kind of off to the races after that. Like, there's no more easy tests after that. And not to say he's had any easy fights before that, but Ian Heinrich has definitely put himself in the perfect position to get into that. Like you said, we're probably not going to see any of these guys get title shots this year or next year, but Ian Heinrich seems to be... He's probably going to be the first contender series guys, other than Johnny Walker, of course, who might get that title shot just because his skill set's so developed and he's really shown that he is well-rounded in every aspect. Now, there's two female fighters that, in my mind's eye, they're really going to make a big push for the UFC, really going to maybe go into title contention in the next two or three years um, that we've had recently in the last 24 months. One of them being Sabina Mazo, who we haven't really seen pan out as well as you thought you'd, you you would see. Um, listen, Colombian fighter... You know, kind of reminiscent of Alejandra Lara that we've yeah, seen in Bellator of. as well. Kind of taking the same route uh, the two of them have. But the one that's really shone, really bright, she has huge aspirations. She Listen, she wants to break a John Jones record. So that's that's Tough thing to do. pretty high company. But Macy Barber, she's already 2-0 in the UFC. I think she is primed for success. I think once she fights, a, like, th there's some really like tough Like, she's fighting tests. Jillian Robertson in her next fight, and that's going to be one of the tougher tests of his career. And Especially I where it's in Canada, too, against a Canadian. Exactly, and one who's a phenomenal grappler at that. I mean, and again, not to make this a Jillian Robertson show, but she's one of these people you really want to test a young star like Macy Barber. And I know it's kind of like one of those prospect versus prospect fights, and the winner of that's definitely going to propel themselves at that division. And in division as shallow as flyweight, too, one or two good wins can really put you into that title contention. And I mean, listen, Robertson coming off a big win very, very recently. But you look at Macy Barber and the skill set she possesses. Her strikes are top notch. Are. She does have a lot of power as well. So one of those things that you have to worry about with Macy Barber. But she's one of our top five from season two as far as success.
Now there's two left. I'm going to go with a softball here. A guy who's already two and one and a lightning rod for controversy in the UFC. A guy who got a development deal. We already mentioned him in Greg Hardy. And I know the majority of the narrative is negative, but you look at those two wins and again, you want to talk softball. I mean, poor Dmitry Smolyakov. That was that was rough. I'm 99% sure Craig could have beaten him. But the win against Juan Adams, you saw him neutralize the takedown attempt. Juan Adams went way too deep. And like an ankle pick where, I mean, he was trying to pick into ice. And instead of picking it, he froze into it. He just froze on that ankle. And Greg Hardy, all he had to do was just flail away and get the win. But his ceiling is high for sure. I know a lot of people, doubters, haters alike have said, listen, put him up against Derek Lewis. Put him up against, you know, somebody in, like, yeah. the top People just five. want to see him get knocked out. That's They're not they're not going to do no. that. They're just going to keep working him in. He's still early in his career. And he's one of those guys that keeps saying, you know, I'm growing every fight. And it's hard not to agree with that statement exactly. because you just look at the progression that he's able to have. He's one of those guys that has to kind of cool the temper, obviously. But he's one of those guys that, yeah, his ceiling definitely is high. He's relatively young for the heavyweight division. He's certainly young in fight years. I mean, oh, compared yeah. to, no let, like, pick a guy like Derek Lewis. He's been fighting for the longest time. And if you want to consider somebody maybe a journeyman in the heavyweight division, there are plenty, but he would be one of them. But Greg Hardy, I mean, he's under 10 professional fights, yeah. so he's got room to improve. He's one grow. of those guys, no matter what you think of him personally, professionally, just looking at his experience, his kind of improvements fight to fight, he is going to be a problem in the heavyweight division, I feel at least, but he's not going to be a problem for a couple of years. Yeah. And if you want, like, you could say, oh, rush him into Derek Lewis, rush him into Francis Ngannou, because they're going to beat him. It doesn't matter. Cyril Gane. Exactly. Those types of people would beat him, but... If you want to see them develop a real prospect, this is how you do it. Don't do the Aaron Pico route where you're like, oh, let's have him fight all these top-ranked fighters and he gets knocked out. No, you want to go real slow, real slow, real slow. Give him different challenges as he moves his way up until he can kind of develop that full set of skills. So they are developing him the right way, no matter what you think of him personally. Uh, yeah, so Greg Hardy definitely belongs on this list. And then our fifth fighter from Season 2 of Dana White's Contender Series. Good. This guy's already 3-0. and oh. I mean, he's way below 25. He's super young. His older brother is going to be fighting in this season of the Contender Series, crazy. which gives it away. Edmund Shabazian, I mean, 3-0 and in his UFC tenure. Listen, his first fight, awful. Uh, yikes. I mean, the cardio is definitely an issue. <laughs> I jumped a lot off of people, train. Yeah, a lot of people thought that Stewart, Darren Stewart, had won I that did. fight. Um, but since then, two really quick finishes in his last two fights, and this guy looks like he could be a force. Edmund Shabazian is a problem. I mean, his wrestling's phenomenal. Even though he comes from head movement, Edmund uh, Tarverdi, and you and would... Ron Rose, he's head coach. Exactly. You would think that he'd be very striking heavy, but his grappling's phenomenal. He's one of the better wrestlers at the middleweight division, even given his youth and kind of lack of experience. But he can really do it all. He's a very well-rounded MMA fighter. He's definitely wrestling heavy. But if the fight stays on the feet, he's more than adept than uh, dealing with any issues. All right, Matt. So season two of Dana White's Contender Series now it was still somewhat fresh in our minds last summer. And it still is now because we had the first week, there was a lot of controversy in this there episode. Was. And we had a lot of people that were actually signed into the UFC. So if we go bottom to top, we had Kevin Holland, Montel Jackson, Greg Hardy, um, and he was taken on Austin Lane. That was a big fight because both of those guys both competed in the NFL. It was a huge seller. Like, season two was going off, you know. It started strong. It like, did it start strong. You had Chris Curtis and Sean Lally, which is a really big fight. I mean, Sean Lally was, you know, one of those guys on the regional scene that a lot of people recognize. Chris Curtis finishes him with a hook kick and Sorry. follows it up by TKO. And then doesn't get a contract. And then he retires, which he's done a couple of times since. He had pretty decent success with the PFL this past season, but he's bounced around since. A lot of people wanted him to get a contract. And then in your main event, you had Alonzo Menafield taking on Deshaun Boatwright. Alonzo Menafield getting the win there. He ends up in the UFC. Greg Hardy gets a contract. And Kevin Holland, while he didn't get a contract, he eventually uh, was end up... I was going to say, Kevin Holland's fought more than both those guys combined in the UFC. They brought Kevin Holland into UFC 227. A lot of people recognized him. That kicked off the main card of the pay-per-view, and he faced Thiago Santos. <laughs> That's and such a hard blood draw. He didn't get knocked out. He, he got didn't. taken down a lot. He got beat up for like 14 and a half minutes. But, but. out of that week one... There's a couple of guys that have made some noise, but there's one guy that I think is going to be consistent in the UFC and ranked. And I know a lot of people aren't going to want to hear it, but I think Greg Hardy... I disagree so much. I think he's I a think top 15 UFC heavyweight just because it's a division where... Oh, it's shallow. 
In, yeah, it's shallow. But That's... here's the problem. Montel Jackson, just as a fighter, is so much better than Greg Hardy. I get that due to the division, Greg Hardy might be a little bit higher rankings-wise because the division's a lot more shallow, but as a pure talent, and Montel Jackson's had some bad performances in the UFC too, but him at his best is actually a guy who you could see maybe one day getting into the top 15. Maybe not staying around for a long time, but he always puts on exciting fights. I would say uh, he'd be my highest of those. But even Greg Hardy, uh, controversy aside whatnot, I think we've learned a few things from Greg Hardy. He's better than a lot of people want to admit that he is, but he's a lot more boring than people realize. Like, Greg Hardy, when he fights an actual good fighter, the best Soli fight, I know the puffer was a problem in that, but it kind of showed that he has that little bit of a burst, and then he slows down. And he's not really fighting the highest skill level guys right now, and that's why I don't know if I can put him in that top 15, just because we haven't seen him other than Volkov. We haven't really seen him against anyone good yet, because there's been such a big difference between, okay, Ben Sassoli and Alexander Volkov that I don't really know where we can put his ceiling. We just know it's in between those two fighters, but that's such a big range that it's really hard to see I, where he's going. I think top 15 is kind of where he'll stay, whether he advances up in a top 10 category, that remains to be seen, but he has faced top 10, maybe even top 5 talent before with top Volkov. One. But it's just one fight. That's my point. Like it's, just, it. it's really hard to get, save from that one fight. So if we move on, week two was where you get a contract, you get a contract, everybody gets a contract, and there's a couple of names that we've already talked about. This is where Ryan Spann got a contract contract um if we go from bottom to top again Chikaze. dwight grant ryan span austin springer gets a win over giga chikadze and we end up seeing giga chikadze in the ufc anthony hernandez who competes at middleweight and matt sales getting the win over yazan hedgy now this is where again we've seen these guys in the ufc we've seen matt sales anthony hernandez we haven't seen a lot of him in the Wait ufc on. and i know you know he won that fight overturned um to no contest because he tested positive for marijuana which again it's just one of those things i wish we could see more of anthony hernandez because i wish like i have no idea what his ceiling is no. he's looked good in the ufc it's just we haven't seen enough of him it's a dumb rule but still follow it like that's all you have to do the only person i would say in terms of high ceiling and getting ranked in their division uh ryan span right now ryan spans look pretty good um he had that win over one of the noguera brothers minotaro noguera 39 is telling you ryan's no ryan spans okay carl roberson knocked him out like five seconds though so it's really hard to say that he's gonna be a top talent and he beat an old man up in his last fight but like <laughs> i don't know if i'd say that but. all right so we move on to week three we had quite a few different people ending up in the ufc um if you go bottom to top jordan williams getting the win over tim karen jordan williams right now um petitioning for bigger and better things i know mike heck just had a really good interview with him um and he's kind of made the rounds there and his story from that week was the fact that he's a type one diabetic and he was using um it was animal grade insulin because he couldn't afford actual insulin it costs a lot of money in the states which i like it, living in canada it was crazy to yeah, hear that story because Something like that probably wouldn't happen up here for us. But uh, Jordan Williams, I mean, continuing to fight. It's, it's crazy. Um, Julian Rosa got a win That's over Jamal sure. Amherst. A couple of recognizable names there. Julian Rosa getting, what, his second shot in the UFC? Third yeah. shot? Like, he's, he's been, been around. around for a little while. Josh Parisian getting the win over Greg Rebello, who came in back in from Season 1 into Season 2. Now I'm going to stop with our co-main and our main event. Please we do. had T. Edwards getting a win over Austin Tweedy. We had Antonina Shevchenko getting a win over Jamie Navarra. Antonina Shevchenko at women's flyweight is always going to be in a weird spot. It's like um, being Nick Sarah. Your brother's Matt Sarah. You're going to have a weird run in the UFC. Antonina Shevchenko, <laughs> for, her, for her, she's in the same division as her sister. So let's say Antonina Shevchenko hypothetically goes yeah. on a heater. It's she, not going to happen, though. But she's probably not going to fight her sister. Yeah. And I think her ceiling's capped at 125. Now, T. Edwards came in with a lot of promise. And then all of a sudden, he fights Don Madge, who go out there and look. Because Don Madge is having a hard time. Like, the UFC is not offering him no. fights. He'll land a 1-2 head kick, though. And Ooh, it'll put you to sleep real quick. Yeah, T. Edwards, I mean, he's only had two fights in the UFC. Two, and... Dennis Bermudez was the second one. And in the Bermudez fight, he just didn't have cardio. Like, he looked really good for 30 seconds. And it was one of those, like, Kimbo Slice things where it wasn't like a gradual decline. It was, oh, no, he exploded. I think he dropped Bermudez. Bermudez gets right back up because he's dropped in every fight. And then 
Edwards just had nothing left in the gas tank after that little explosion. I mean, we just got done watching that Shane Carwin fight. It was a little bit, it was kind of similar to Shane Carwin, Brock Lesnar, where there was such a big difference between that first and second round. But in the T. Edwards fight, it was a, such a big difference between the first and second minute. So really weird performance. He's been one of the guys I've been the most disappointed with, if I can be completely honest, in and, Two Snake and, and I want to turn that around. I wish we got to see some more of him. I really I do. do. But I just think from the two performances you've shown me, you got knocked out by a guy who no one knew who he was. Now, of course, Madge is a really good fighter, and no one knew at the time, but still, we have to take the loss at the time. And then Dennis Bermudez, who had openly, he had lost four in a row, and he was going to retire after that fight, and he had barely trained, and he still beat the brakes off him. So, when those are your two losses in the UFC, I don't know if you get a third chance. If it was maybe lose a split decision, and then lose a unanimous one, and you had kind of excuses for both, but no, you lost to a guy retired, and to a guy who not a lot of people have heard of. So, it's unfortunate that that was his trajectory, but him and Antonina Shevchenko, I like what you said, she's kind of stuck in that division, because Valentina's not going to lose that belt for a very long time. And Antonina is always going to be that Shevchenko sister. And it's unfortunate that that's what she's known as. But, like, he's Mr. Fight Night Picks, and I'm just the guy who sits to the left, I guess. So, Antonina, I don't know if she could ever make 115. I would like to see her maybe try, maybe 135. Just whatever's easiest for her. But... I don't know if she's ever going to make it in that top 10. Even in a shallow division, that Roxanne Modafferi fight, and it just she's been kind of the hype killer at that division as of late, but the that fight really ruined the Shevchenko train for me. I was on board. I wasn't the conductor, but I was definitely near the front of the train, and then that fight just sort of ruined it for me. Was not on the caboose. Was not on the caboose. <sighs> the so caboose. we move into week number four, and again, quite a few names that ended up in the UFC. You had Jalen Turner. You had Jordan Espinoza. You had uh, Bavon Lewis and Kevin Aguilar. Now Bavon Lewis goes from, uh, what was it, a developmental deal. He gets a full contract. And in that, uh, you know, lightweight main event where you have Kevin Aguilar winning a split, I know Kevin Aguilar didn't get signed to a contract, but he ended up in the UFC. I mean, he just fought a tough fight and a tough opponent where it was wrestling versus wrestling. But Kevin Aguilar at lightweight, maybe he's not ranked, but I think he's going to have some, com com some more competitive fights and in the UFC. I think that's an important thing to say. Just because we're saying a guy's not going to be champion doesn't mean you can't be a big fan of these people. Like, Edmund Shabazian is a guy we're about to talk about, and I think he does have one of the higher ceilings out of anyone, but even if you're not going to be a champ, it doesn't mean, like, your career's kind of over. Like, there's so many good fighters who don't have a number next to their name who just put on really exciting fights, and there's a lot of people from these seasons who I can see just being those people for a lot of their career. So if we go into week number five where Matt's alluding to, and we'll talk about the people that ended up in the UFC Listen, we had Edmund Shabazian, Domingo Polarte, and Macy Barber from this episode. And, you know, special shout out, I guess, Vince Morales, who a lot of people recognize, and Austin Vanderford, who just so happened to end up in Bellator. Exactly. So it's worth mentioning. But, okay, so we have three fighters there. One of those fighters, Domingo Polarte, just had his last fight overturned from a first round knockout loss to an O contest against Journey Newsom, who tested positive for. Marijuana metabolites Got again. Stuff. Now, the two fighters that won contracts here, very, very high ceilings and very young and earlier in their early in their careers. We have Edmund Shabazian and Macy Barber. Now, I know Macy Barber, when we talked about her last summer, there was still a lot of shine. Now, a lot of that went away when she <laughs> fought Roxanne Montefiore. I still think that you can still have some hype and you can still have a lot of belief because, again, she's so young in her career. Like, I and know, the division show. I know, like, let's compare and make the comparison. So she wanted to be the youngest champion in UFC history over John Jones. John Jones lost the fight when he was in and around that time to Matt Hamlin. Really? He lost There's the... levels to losses, though. That's not a great That's answer. true. Macy Barber, like, she lost that fight to Roxanne exactly. Ferry. But, again, it can either be a total lump, like you had when... And it's not easy to compare them. She but... tore ACL, that's my thing. Like, we're not going to see her for eight months at the minimum, no matter what. So she can either... Take a lump like um, like Ronda Rousey did and absolutely just let it derail her. Or she can come back stronger. Oh. And it's tough off when That's you have a I mean. major like, knee injury. It's tough. We're not going to see a new and improved Macy Barber for about a year and a half. That's the problem. We're going to see her back once after the ACL. She's probably not going to look very good. And then once after that. So she needs kind of a warm-up fight for us to really know how much that injury affected her. Because ACLs are weird. They either affect you a lot or they don't affect you at all. And it doesn't really... It, there's only a body type. You can't be built like Mark Hunt and Terry ACL, and I can 100% say, oh, that person's never going to be the same. They could come back and be 100% fine. They could come back and never be the same. It's a big problem in basketball. But for Macy, with her being so young, that shouldn't be too bad of a recovery. She should be able to get back to at least close to 100%. And I do agree with you. I feel like out of the hunt, or out of this season especially, she has one of the higher ceilings. But that loss was just so bad. You can't go and tear your ACL 
and basically get TKO'd multiple times in that fight because she wasn't fighting back for a lot of it and then just keep on talking your trash. So, like, I, I agree. You hope that she comes out of it kind of like Tony Ferguson where you're just training really hard every day and you want to make that new and improved better version of yourself. But this season, or this whole episode just has to be talked about Edmund Shabazian. The leaps and improvements that this guy has made since that Darren Stewart fight like, where I was so down on him. And oh, here. The, from Darren Stewart to Brad Tavares, the jump in competition, Big. the jump in the rankings, the jump in name value. Not even the fact that he won a split decision to Darren Stewart and then knocked out Brad Tavares with a head kick in the first round. Like that's the that's the leap this guy's taken in one year. Now, Edmund Shabazian trains under one of the greatest coaches ever. Edmund Tarverdi. Exactly. And so, his head coach was Ronda Rousey. Yes, and she acted as his manager too. But uh, Edmund Shabazian, I don't know if he'll be a champion, but I think we will see him in a title fight at some point in his career. I'd really like to see him and Adesanya match up. Just, you've got, I know Adesanya's a little bit older, but he's still sort of the younger guy in the division. Just He's a little bit newer to the UFC, but that would be such a huge fight down in the future. I think so. Both guys really good on the mic. I have very high hopes for Edmund Shabazian, at least now in his career. I'd really like to see him get matched up against some of those higher guys in one or 185. This is what I hope they don't do, though, because I think matchmaking is very key at this point in his career. Don't make him fight Yoel Romero next. Because I've seen some people on Twitter talking about how they want to see Edmund Shabazian fight Yoel Romero. And if you want to derail a hype train, make your favorite fighter fight Yoel Romero. Because even if he wins, and let's say Edmund Shabazian goes out there and puts on a display, he's not going to be the same fighter afterwards unless it's a boring fight like the Adesanya one. So Edmund Shabazian, out of everyone in the whole show, I think is the high ceiling. Okay, now we go to week six. And again, you talk about high ceilings. There's fighters from week six that I think also have high ceilings. Now, we start off at the bottom. So you have Chase Hooper getting a win. He gets a developmental contract. He ends up in the UFC. A lot of people... Good Twitter game. Uh, yeah, good Twitter game. And a lot of people thought, okay, still, he's way too young. He's small for the division of featherweight. Like, he's really tall, skinny, and long. And they put him in there against one of the Tamor brothers. Daniel. And we picked... Little Tamor. Chase Hooper to win that fight. We get a lot of hate for picking okay. Chase Hooper to win that I'm fight. I'm not even going to say that I thought he was going to win. I just know Daniel Tamer's not amazing, and that's why I picked a. But uh, Chase Hooper. Hooper, Chase Hooper looked good. He got cracked. He did, they but choked that he man looked. Out. Yeah, exactly. He fought through adversity and got a win. I don't know what his ceiling is. I don't know if he's going to be future champion at 145. If he's going to be ranked future at 145. For M&Ms. But Chase Hooper, listen. So far, he's marketed himself Enjoy well. The ride. He, yeah, he's on the way up. We won't cap him. Jeff Hughes gets a win over Josh Appel. I'll put a cap on Jeff Hughes. Jeff Hughes has a fight. He had a fight booked for Portland. It wasn't Columbus. I think it was Portland. Against Tanner Bozer. Again, another litmus test fight. But Jeff Hughes hasn't really done it uh, no, in terms of the UFC. Heard. Former LFA champ. Then he had Sadiq Yusuf fighting Mike Davis. I want to say this. I think Sadiq Yusuf has a, has a high ceiling at lightweight. Too. If if cardio uh, isn't if sorry if cardio isn't an issue for Sadiq Yusuf, I think he can be a superstar. He fought Mike Davis. Go back and watch Mike Davis's last Mike fight Davis over good. Thomas Gifford. Holy smokes! Not. Holy smokes! Mike Davis had a good fight, but we're focusing on Sadiq Yusuf. I don't know what's next for him, but this is a guy that I want to see more in the UFC. I know we focused on it a lot in our earlier, um, you know, kind of go over of season two, but he's one of those guys that I think has a really I, high ceiling. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Sadiq Yusuf at 145, it's been interesting though, because as his level of competition started to get a little bit better in his last couple fights, we've noticed that he's not just going out there and knocking everyone out to the same degree that he was when he first came in the UFC. Uh, Benito Lopez, he did knock him out in the first round, but still he got cracked, he got dropped at one point, and he faced a lot of adversity. And then his last one against Andre Feely, it was a close fight when the judges score cards came in i thought he did win but feely landed some good shots and he made him work for and, everything and andre feely if you want to talk a guy a that's been around the ufc forever and you wouldn't think it and he's still young too Max which Holloway, is weird way back in the day. but again you talk litmus test that's a really good litmus test 100%. for a young guy on his way up and i think sadiq yusuf will he be champ tomorrow probably not but it's always good to see um, a guy like Sadiq Yusuf coming off contender series, getting those big impressive wins, getting jumps up in competition. And I think, again, future star. I know who I want to see him fight next, too. If Calvin Cater beats Jeremy Stevens, and if they decide to keep those two together, I want to see him fight Jeremy Stevens. That's fair. That's fair. I think Something there's lots of different, you know, stylistic matches you can make at that, 45. That's the hardest thing with saying Sadiq Yusuf is going to be champion or going to fight in a title fight. For that to happen, he has to beat Alexander Volkanovsky, Max Holloway, maybe Jose Aldo, Jeremy Stevens, Yair Rodriguez to beat 
Korean Zombie, Brian Ortega. Like, those are the top six or seven in that division. So, it's just that division's so good, right? Like, historically great right now. So, yeah. it, it's just, it's a long path to get to there. And and don't push him too far. Exactly. Please That's don't really push him too far. Take your time. Then, of course, in your co-main, in your main, in, her, in your main, you have Alex Munoz getting the win over Nick Newell. And then in your co-main, Jimmy Crute gets a win. Now, Jimmy Crute at 205. Yeah, it's been good. It's been bad. So at this point, it's been good. I mean, he won his last fight over Michael Olszewczyk in, uh, it was in Auckland in 2020. In seconds. Yeah, I mean, a great win there. So for Jimmy Crute, again, he's one of those guys that it's tough to try and predict what the trajectory is at 205 pounds because we don't even know if our champions still are champion right now in John Jones at the time of filming this. So for Jimmy Crute, I think I, an I think a ranking next to his name wouldn't be out of the question. His name's Johnny Walker. It's just going to be tough against... Some good competition. It is, but and again, Jimmy Crute, he's kind of lucky that he's in the division that he's in. He's a big guy for one, or for 205, sorry. He's a decent grappler if he's the offensive one. If he's the one initiating the grappling, if he's taking people down, really good. We saw that in his last fight. The problem, though, is when we see him on his back, when he's on the back foot, that's when he kind of starts to struggle a little bit. So still kind of a raw talent, but he's showing a lot of promise. So then we move on to week number seven, and we're going in-depth on these seasons of Contender Series. Just to offer a bit of a recap... So week seven, we had quite a few people that ended up in the UFC. We have Juan Adams, Jordan Griffin, Ian Heinish, Dante Mays, and Roosevelt Roberts. Now, not all of those guys got contracts. Four of them did. Uh, the one guy that didn't was Dante Mays, but he ended up in the UFC and fighting Cyril Gaon. Now, this was his second time on Contender Series. Now, out of all of these guys, Juan Adams, no longer with the UFCs, with Arius FC. Jordan Griffin just got a big win. Like, he needed that win because it wasn't trending all that well. But for Jordan Griffin, again... I don't know if he ends up with a name or a number next to his name anytime soon. Ian Heinish has had that number, and then it didn't go well. Uh, uh, his last, his last time out. That Russian cat whose name evades me. Ian Heinish is weird because he it's like he's always tired from the second he walks into the cage, but he just never gets more tired. So he starts at about a 6 out of 10 on the uh, cardio scale, and then he just stays there. And that's it. And he's just sort of this marauding force. He's always going to walk forward. He's always going to do what he does well. And the Derek Brunson fight, which wasn't that long ago, dropped him with a head kick a minute into the fight. And it looked like it was going his way immediately. But the problem is, Ian Hines doesn't have that second or third gear. He's a power puncher, but he likes to back up. So it's a really odd kind of combination. It reminds me of Lorenz Larkin. Because Lorenz Larkin, when you look, he has good power, but he's more like a volume guy, but he chooses the pot and, shot. And that's what Ian Heinish reminds me and of. And the thing with Ian Heinish too, like they bring him into the UFC. So he gets a win over Justin Sumter on the season of uh, Dana White's Contender Series. Then they put him against Cesar Fajaya, who's had some big fights. Yeah, on short notice. And it was a great fight. And then they put him up against Shoeface, Antonio Carlos Jr. And he fights well. He got out of some very difficult well, positions indeed. and then they go you know what Derek Brunson there's your next guy and you know in terms of Ian Heinish really good wrestling and good power as well but against a guy like Derek Brunson all right that was too tough of a test then they move back a little bit Omari Akhmedov and then it didn't go well from there either and that so, fight was weird because it was like he was fighting a mirror the whole time because mm. both guys started to do the same thing so Ian Heinish I know he's lost two in a row I don't think it's it for him, though. I yeah. Like, they're going to give him more opportunities, and he will win more fights sooner rather than later. It was kind of wild, though. Like, two fights in his UFC career, he just beat Shoe Face, and they're talking about Channing Tatum playing him in a movie all of a sudden. So it was really weird to see how fast uh, his career was sort of trending upwards. And then these two losses of 100% put a damper on it, but I don't think this is the end for Ian Hunnish, and I think we will see him with a number next to his name in the near future. And then you move on to week number eight. Again, we get Greg Hardy in a main event, Hardy. gets another win. Uh, Devontae Smith gets a win, and then you also have Kendi and Shekwu getting another win on Contender Series, finally getting that contract. Bobby Moffat gets a contract. And yeah, that rounds out the second season. So for me, just based off a of name value, there are a lot of signings. There are a lot of people that are still with the UFC, still putting on good performances and getting wins. I don't know if I'd have... I'd, I'd probably say season one above season two. I'd probably rank them one, two, and three if it was just me, based on the fact that season one made such an immediate impact that we've had three seasons plus a Brazilian season. And we had two possible contenders come out of the first season. With season two, I feel like we have a lot more good fighters, but season one has the best fighters out of the whole group. So season two, a lot more volume. You get a lot more guys you can recognize in the UFC at this point. But no, season one, I feel like had the better ones when you really get to the top with uh, Jeff Neal, of course, and Sean O'Malley. So if we go back, let's listen to our take on season three. I know we didn't really get into it a whole lot, but we'll offer a bit of a recap because again... Uh, when we did this original episode, it was August of 2019, so it was still a little too... So if we have a look at Season 3 of Dana White's Contender Series, from. which we've said it's it's uh, murky waters to say the it least. Is. 
This is a tough one because the question of success can be measured in so many different ways. And a guy who's already been a part of the UFC and then found a ton of success since he was with the UFC in his very short tenure. The PFL. Brendan Lochnane. I mean, the guy put on a great performance in the contender series this year. Didn't get signed. Everybody was upset about it. Now he gets a shot in the PFL. He has a chance to win a million dollars. It's it's a good story. I thought he'd end up with Bellator simply because they've been putting on a big European push. But were you surprised signing PFL? I kind of was because I was in the same boat as you. I really thought that he'd be perfect for Bellator because Bellator is always kind of like they're looking for anyone the UFC kind of gives up on just so they can say we're the one who has them. It's kind of, I don't know, it's almost kind of what they become now. They were sort of the Legends League there for a little while. Now they're in the ex-UFC star league. And not to say he was going to go on to be a big star or anything, but he's definitely a recognizable person. And a lot of that does have to do, and I know Dana White probably didn't want this to happen, but a lot of his popularity has come from the big controversy of him not getting signed. Yeah, for sure. And I think he's going to be one of those guys who's primed for success wherever he goes. I mean... He's been a consummate professional. He's also been a professional fighter for a really long time exactly. as well. And a well-known guy. And listen, he finally got a shot to go back in the UFC. It backfired on them, I believe. And exactly. listen, truth be told, they don't make a lot of mistakes. But I think this was one that, yeah, they, they might regret. Dane will say they don't, but they might. This will be so, like the Ryan Bader thing. If we continue on through this, I mean, let's go with a, a couple of shout-outs. So, yeah. A, from this past week, Herbert Burns gets a contract. Yeah, this is a guy... Him at featherweight that can kind of listen he's he's kind of like a like a swiss army knife he can get it done in all sorts of different ways he can certainly get the submission as well and you've got his brother gilbert fighting this weekend so herbert signed to the ufc you've got a tale of two brothers a great story one other guy that it was announced this past week has a fight coming up is teddy ash and we told you about him a couple of weeks ago actually it was trademark mma's question to us who are some of these canadians we should be paying attention to and of course we're going to be doing a big play on UFC Vancouver. I know there's a lot of shows that you might be able to find us on for that. Um, but as far as the Contender Series is concerned, Teddy Ash has a fight coming up. He's been with Unified MMA out of Alberta for a long time, fighting there. Obviously, his good friend Tanner Bozer was supposed to fight here recently on the Edmonton card, his hometown. Of course, Lemos uh, decided to uh, vit, vit and uh, yeah, Can't couldn't, pa- no vit, couldn't vit. pass the old test. But uh, yeah, looking forward to Teddy Ash coming up later on this year. And I'm going to rattle off a couple of names of three guys that have really high potential. I know if you're a big Dana White Contender Series fan, if you're a big um, Midwestern MMA fan, you're going to recognize these names. And Brennan Allen, perfect uh, last name, Miles Johns, and Hunter Azure. And the last fighter there, and listen, Miles Johns is probably the most UFC ready. Oh, with Brennan Allen, I think he's going to find success, and I think he'll do well. We've seen some of the fights that he's had in the past against UFC competition. Hunter Azure is a guy that has a win streak that dates back as far as time can go. No, realistically, let's look at him on Tapology, Matt. Just bring him yeah. up really quick. Because if you look at him as a pro, I mean, he just started as a pro in 2017. So many amateur fights. You go to his, yeah, a ton of amateur fights. But back to 2014 was the last time that he lost a fight. Huge win streak. Plenty of finishes as well. Last two are decisions. But it's that top fight that makes sense to me. And that's why I really wanted to talk about him here. Because... Listen, we're talking about Canadian MMA. If you're new to the program, we're from Fredericton, New Brunswick, well, yeah. Canada. But Beautiful city. Um, Hunter Azure is going to be taking on Brad Katona. And this was a fight that a lot of people are excited for. Yes. UFC Vancouver. A, because for some reason, Brad Katona has been one of the you know better performing SBG fighters in the last calendar year. Didn't do well in his last one, though. No, but he's he's one of the more uh, but active. But I mean, still, yeah. Active. Connor lost his last one. Connor lost his last one. It's not. No, well. You know. Either way, but Hunter Azure's, you know, it's a tough test in your first fight it in is. UFC. You got Katona, who won one of the more recent seasons of The Ultimate Fighter. So, that rounds it out, but it's it's tough to tell so far through season three. Exactly, you have to more or less agree, and I'll uh, I'll bring it back up once more. But you have to more or less agree with Luke Thomas here. And listen, when can you not agree with Luke exactly. Thomas? The guy knows what he's talking about. But yeah, it just feels like season three is a little bit more watered down. Some of these fighters that we mentioned are yeah maybe a little bit more UFC ready, but from season one and two, 
I think those fighters will have obviously quicker success in UFC, but I feel like their highs are going to be higher I, that season. Three. I agree. Like some of the names we pulled out from the earlier seasons, you have guys like Ian Heinish and Jeff Neal, who realistically you could see them in the top 15, I guess with Heinish he is already, but you can see these guys in the top 15, in the top 10, you know, possibly even main eventing like a fight night down the road somewhere. And you can't really say that for any of the people in season three just yet. Like give it a year, give it two years, just to let their careers sort of breathe a little bit so we kind of have a better idea as to where they're going to sit. All right, Matt. So season three of Dan Dana White's contender series again we've seen some of these fighters making an impact in the UFC and I think with the or first PFL. with the first week to the two people that were signed they've had quite an immediate impact in the UFC and I'm talking about Punaheli or Puna Soriano as well as Jorgen De Castro. and we also saw Hannah Goldie get a chance in the UFC she didn't get a contract on that episode and Brandon Lochnane was kind of the talk of the town he gets a win over Bill Algio where he absolutely dominated and this fight he, of the night but yeah, he took him down with 10 seconds left and he didn't get signed because, again, he took him down and somehow he's a boring fighter, which we've talked about. It's that entertainment value with the UFC that typically propels you even more and, and forward. And this is the thing. Like, when I first started becoming a hardcore, if you will, it used to really tick me off that the rankings were busted the way they are. But once you kind of indoctrinate yourself enough into the sport, you just realize this is how things work. So, like, you want to kind of help people figure it out, too. I don't think fighters realize right now how important it is to just be on Twitter. Every main event's canceled. All you have to do is make people talk about you, and you're all of a sudden a main event or a co-main event of a show. Sean O'Malley has a good performance in his last time out, and then he goes and does the whole, you know, hitting the mitts yeah. and running with his shirt, like, and people gravitate towards it. it. Same as Chase Hooper. So yeah, make yourself available on social media. Jorgen Castro is an example of that. I see him on Instagram and Twitter all the time posting stuff, and he has a big fight booked already with Greg Hardy after getting a like huge win over Justin Taffa in Australia. I mean, that was a great win for him. So Punaheli Soriano, in the division he's in, I don't know how big of an impact he's going to be able to make, but if he can keep knocking people the out... The Oscar Payota fight was nice. Yeah, if he can keep knocking people out, I mean, all of a sudden, that entertainment value, boom, you're on the scene. And Same Hawaiians, as they love Hawaiians in the UFC. Like, the fact that there hasn't been a card in Hawaii yet is absurd. So hopefully if they ever do that, and someday soon, then he could be on the main card. Week number two, you're talking about Miles Johns and Miguel Baez getting contracts i know miguel baeza was booked into a fight here somewhat recently the name evades me who was supposed to fight um but miles johns at 135 has looked quite good yeah, like and i know in this fight against richie santiago a good job for him there as well but in terms of name value on that card not as much in week two and this is where we're going to start to see it's kind of settling because yeah. you've drawn and zapped so much out of local talent, not just in the States, but in North America, in Europe as well. Um, even moving into week number three, I mean, we're talking about a lot of contracts handed out. Holy crow. Um, you've got Jonathan Pierce. Everyone who won got one. Jonathan Pierce, Maki Patolo, Hunter Azure, Antonio Trucoli, and Joseph Selecki. And listen, I mean, out of these guys, I mean, Maki Patolo's been so-so. Uh, Hunter Azure looked great in Vancouver. He took on Brad Katona, got a win there. So for anybody out of this episode, it's kind of weird that so many people got contracts, but Hunter Azure's probably that guy just out of that episode that has the high ceiling, especially um, at 135 pounds. Then you move on to week number four. You had Antonio Ahoyo, Ode Osborne, Dante Mays again. Like they just kept giving him shots and finally got a contract. Um, Brennan Allen and Kevin Seiler. Brennan Allen's been pretty good. I would say that out of anybody there, yeah. Antonio Hoyo had that weird fight where it was Brazil against Brazil of contender series guys. First off, he looks like a heavyweight, so how he makes 185, I'll never know. But he was kind of marketed as the new Thiago Santos, and we just never got it. So. Yeah, it just hasn't happened. Ode Osborne at 135, I mean, making moves and starting grooves. You never know what's going to happen for him. Um, and Dante Mays, again, at heavyweight, they kept bringing him in, and he kept getting wins uh, on Contender Series. And then in the UFC, I just don't know if it's going to be an impact. But Brendan Allen at 185, is he, he's been susceptible to getting hit. Yeah, but he doesn't care, though. Holy smokes, has he looked pretty good. If you want a fun fight, watch Brendan Allen fight. We're not just saying this because he shares the last name with us. Brendan Allen, uh, kind of marketed as sort of a grappler, but really good striking, really good wrestling, too. Just sort of a well-rounded athlete. Reminds me a lot of Ian Heinish, to be completely honest, so I'd like to see those guys fight in the future. But definitely the best guy from that episode, if not this whole season. Because season three, just for the record, it's the worst of the seasons. Well, you you had season one down there, but now oh, it sounds man. like you're flip-flopping. But in, two, in three, one. again, in the fifth week, so we have Jordan Williams coming back on, doesn't get a win. Uh, Sean Woodson gets a win, gets signed. You have Jamal Hill and Billy Quarantillo getting contracts. 
Those are the two guys that I want to focus on. Not that Sean Woodson doesn't have a promising career in the UFC, but Jamal Hill fighting Darko Stozic on the opener of that North Carolina card from Rally. Holy smokes, Jamal Hill looked great. And yeah, his hands weren't overly high. He kept them kind of low, but his kicks and his range are great. And I think at, at 205, a guy like Jamal Hill, a guy like Ryan Spann, we've seen it with Rakic, long rangey guys that are able to move up the ranks. If Jamal Hill can string together some wins in 2020, if 2020 happens, then, you know, he could have a decent you know I want to see him fight. You're not going to lie. I want to see him fight Ed Herman. Because Ed Herman at 205 right now, he's just a really good guy to throw at prospects because he doesn't get tired, he's hard to knock out. And he's volume heavy. Exactly. Just real gritty. So if you're going to beat him, it's not going to be an easy fight no matter what. You could be, like John Jones probably wouldn't have an easy fight against Ed (laughs) Herman. Ed Herman, he's coming to play. So that's a fight that I would like to see. In the future. And Billy Quarantillo as well. This is a guy, and we've talked about him a little bit recently. A yeah. King of the Cage guy gets the win here, um, and he's going to be facing Gavin Tucker. So hopefully that fight happens. But Billy Quarantillo, a guy to watch yeah, out Yeah, Dana for. White, everything's back to business as usual, April 14th. Week six, we have quite a few people getting contracts. Again, we have Alexa Kamor, Elon Cruz, Tracy Cortez, uh, and Rodrigo Nascimento, who I don't think we've seen in the OC yet. I know we haven't. We've seen Tracy Cortez, and I think especially it whether it's camera. whether it's women's flyweight, wherever, I think she has a marketability, and she's marketed herself quite well, as well as her fighting skills. So I think she could have a good future in the UFC. She's somebody to watch out for, somebody from Phoenix, Arizona. Elon Cruz beat Steven Wynn to get a chance, and man, what a fight that, that was on Contender Series. One of the best fights on Contender <laughs> Series. Mean. Great finish had a tough time out against Spike Carlisle. And maybe we'll bring up Spike Carlisle a little bit later. But Alexa Kamor, getting the win over over Fabio Chernot, people will recognize that name. But Alexa Kamor in his UFC debut, holy smokes. Like, wow. A ton of power from this guy. There's power. There's no cardio or speed to go along with it, unfortunately. So he lost. Like, why are we that excited about his UFC debut? Still, one Alexa loss. Kamer looks intimidating. And then the fight starts and you figure out, he's not that intimidating. So we'll see what happens there. But week number five, so a good, few though. more names to add to it. And then week number seven. So we talked about it. Um, Antonio Hoyo, Andre Muniz, who they were matched up together. He gets a contract out of this episode. Um, you also have Omar Morales. But the point here in this episode was the fact that Herbert Burns. So he gets a win over Derek Minner, which isn't easy. I mean, we saw Derek Minner come in and he fights against Grant Dawson. And it doesn't go his way, but it was on day's notice. And Derek Minner has a ton of experience on the regional scene. For Herbert Burns to get a win like he did on that episode. And then to come into the UFC and take on Nate Landwehr, who... Former M1 Global Champion, another you gritty vet, man, Herbert Burns. I I don't know if you know he's I, not Gilbert. Let's calm down. But I don't know if a number next to his name. I don't know if he's a contender. I need we need to see more of him against do. top competition. I like what I've seen so far though. But yeah, he's not facing guys that are like six and one or six and two. He's facing guys with actual That's records. A very good point. And to see him overcome those guys in impressive fashion. It to me it signals that yes, he definitely has a clear path up. Maybe a fifteen to twenty guy next. Maybe somebody like, like that. A hundred percent. I'd much rather my prospects when I'm looking through the record to have a record of like eleven and four, but actually have fought really good fighters, as opposed to having a guy who's like sixteen to no. But when you actually look at the record, they've only been fighting people who have negative five hundred records. So it's not always a sign that, oh, the record's not great, they're not great, and Burns is amazing, but it really matters just the level of competition they fought on their way up to the UFC. That's all. So for week number eight, this is where there were a lot of really good matchups and you'll recognize a lot of names. I know William Knight, he was in the main event at late heavyweight. They signed him to a developmental deal and then he lost a fight, if not two. Uh, but he's a guy to still keep tabs on. But you also had Brock Weaver, Sarah Alpar, Shani Young, who got a chance on short notice in the UFC. Tony Gravely, Ray Rodriguez was a battle of, uh, you know, regional promotional champions. And Tony Gravely ends up getting the win, ends up in the UFC, and put on a decent performance in his debut. Um, And then you had Julius Anglicus as well. So some recognizable names again. Week number nine, you go through it. Only Philip Rowe gets a gets a chance. Steve Garcia also on this episode, who ends up in the UFC and fights Luis Pena. I'm sure he's going to get more of a chance. 100%. Um, and you don't know, is it a 35? Is it a 45? Who knows? Hopefully 45. Steve Garcia ends up in the UFC. And again, this is where we just keep going through. And week number 10, you had Dusko... Todorovic, he gets a contract with a win over Teddy Ash, the Canadian. We were pumping the tires we of this fight 
Um, and Todorovic, he was supposed to be on the London card, but that fight got scrapped. They were hoping to have it on the Cage Warriors card. It didn't happen. Um, you also had Peter Barrett and TJ Brown getting contracts. And Ben Sassoli was on that episode, didn't get a contract, but ends up in the OC. TJ Brown as well. Um, so he gets the win over Dylan Lockhart. He finishes him. I saw Dylan Lockhart fight before this fight. It was like his entrance into Contender Series. He fought Jesse Erickson, who just got a win over um, Josh Harvey, which is a really big win. big win. And he was on uh, Man vs. Bear on Discovery Channel. But Dylan Lockhart, to lose to TJ Brown, to me, signaled, hey, TJ Brown, if he can beat a good grappler in Dylan Lockhart, then there's a good chance he's going to go far in the UFC. He did lose his debut, so I don't know where that leaves him. He's a main training partner and good buddy of uh, Bryce Mitchell, who believes that the coronavirus was created by the government against the people. But the point is, that's season three of Contender Series. Not as many recognizable names. Not Pretty vague about where what we're going to see for contenders. So season one, you have your blue chip prospects. Season two, a lot of good name value. And maybe we see some people as contenders. Season three, pretty much up in the air. And then you have the Brazilian season, which... Again, a lot of names that ended I up mean, in the UFC. I mean, you have week one. Bontarin, good. Rogério Bontarin, Meyer Buena Silva, Antonio Ahoyo, Sarah Frota, and Augusto Sakai all end up in the UFC. Sarah Frota out. Antonio Ahoyo, who ended up back on Contender Series and losing. Meyer Buena Silva, who just fought. Rogério Bontarin, that's actually looked really good. And Augusto Sakai. That's actually good. A guy that's been in Bellator before and has fought some top talent. And in the UFC, he only has one loss on his record. He's one of those guys that with a few wins, and I know on the hardcore rankings, I have him ranked. I think Augusto Sakai has a pretty good shot at heavyweight to continue to move up the I think ranks. he deserves to be ranked just off the uh, uh, Fabrice Overdoom fought him. The Russian guy. In the main event, he knocked him out in like 30 seconds. Not in the main event. Oh, you're killing me, Craig. This is tough. Who did it go? Marcin Debora, thank you. He's not Russian. He's that, Polish. He's Polish. That Marcin Debora fight really showed me, though. Like, um, Tabora, you can say what you want about him. He's kind of slow. He's not the most athletic guy ever, but he's been in the top 15 for Lord knows how long. So just beating a guy that early in your that early in your career, guy who has that much more experience than you, it really shows a lot. So that one alone should have him in the top 15. But I do agree. Augusto Sakai is a guy who he might not be in the top five. I don't think he'll ever fight for a title, but he's going to be a fun heavyweight for a long time. Yeah, I mean, you look at his record. He has a draw against Dan Charles in Bellator. Then he lost a split decision to Czech Congo. We've seen... He had success in the UFC, and right now in Bellator, holy smokes, check Congo. And then if you look at his UFC run, Chase Sherman, and then Andre Arlovsky, who's that litmus test, and then the win over Marcin Tabora. So Augusto Sakai, a guy to watch. In week two, you had Andre Muniz, Talia Santos, Johnny Walker, mm -hmm. Marina Rodriguez, um, Marcio Alessandri Jr. You also had Enrique De Silva taking on Johnny Walker in that fight that already had a shot in the UFC. This was his second chance. Johnny Walker... I know last summer, everybody was super high on him, loses a few. Like, what what needs to happen for a guy like that to get oh, really? to gain the grace that he had before? So fired up. Yeah, so right after he lost to Corey Anderson, he shouldn't have blamed everyone else for his loss and not himself. I think that's the worst thing a fighter can do. Dominic Cruz is one of my all-time favorite UFC moments when he lost to Cody Garbrandt, and he stood up and he answered every single question anyone had to ask him. And people were asking, like, really, you know, heavy, hard-hitting questions that a lot of other fighters would just get up and laugh. But Dominic Cruz just stood there, and he was like, yeah, this sucks, but, like, my job's pretty good. My life's pretty good. So if this is the worst thing I have to go through, then I'm doing pretty well all in all. Johnny Walker did the 100% opposite. He blamed his girlfriend. He blamed his coaches. He blamed everybody. And I feel like that just ruins your career the second you do that. And his last performance, I know he looked okay on the feet in a few moments against Krylov, but he just didn't seem to have that explosiveness that he did it's not that he wasn't even going for them because he was throwing a flying knee here and there he just didn't really seem to have the same pop behind everything and he seemed unsure of every strike like oh if i throw this flying knee if i don't hit it then i'm probably getting taken and down that's the thing like it's tough to have a good fight against a guy like nikita krilov because on the feet he's adept but on the ground he's he's quite good he's so. good when he's on top so you would think though if you're johnny walker and you're much bigger than him like it did look like two different weight classes were fighting at that point johnny walker you're a tall rangy striker he shouldn't even be able to take you down. You're so far away from him in the first place. So uh, there was just a lot of fight IQ problems in that fight, I think. And I, that's what I'm going to chalk it up to. So if he can get with a camp, quit traveling all over the world, training with different people. I know he had a few coaches who went with him kind of everywhere, but he was big with cross training, going to different gyms and whatnot. Like, Stop doing that. You, you see people have success with that. And the two people that I'll throw it, we've already talked about Douglas them. Lima and... <laughs> Douglas and Diego. And it's weird because these are going to be two sibling pairs. Douglas and Diego... 
and Antonina and Valentina Shevchenko because they'll train. They oh, really? train. I'm gonna. Two of I'm the gonna best t- fighters in the world. Yeah, and their it's brothers. Valentina <laughs> Shevchenko <laughs> trained in the middle of nowhere in Maine for her fight in Toronto. Like at just a hole in the wall gym with just you know average people, and she's she one of the best fighters more. in the world. But in terms of uh, contender series and Johnny Walker, I don't know. Like you'd have to find some consistency, I would think. And again, getting with some wrestlers, getting your confidence back. There's a, a whole slew of gyms in the states that I, I think would help out there. You're not gonna but, like this idea. I'd completely turn the other way into it. I'd go to Thailand, do nothing but train striking. Like which he's gonna, done. He's he's gone he has, there before. And it's weird because it's almost like when he was doing that, he was knocking people out, and now that he's gone to like Russia and TriStar, he's fighting a little bit differently. And here's the problem too: every gym and I, gyms and coaches don't say this, but it's kind of true. Every gym has sort of their own style. Like you, I know ATT fighters just because like who fights there. Robbie Lawler. Uh, Hori Masvidal and Dustin Poirier come from ATT. So it kind of tells you the type of fighters that they're going to have. And yes, they have good wrestlers and whatnot. It's a big roster. But every fight or every gym story kind of has their own style. So if you're expecting to only do one camp there and then implement sort of their style, if you will, into your fight, it's not that fast. It, you can't do it overnight. Go to a gym, stay there for multiple training camps, and actually let that gym kind of mold you to what they want to see you. Because Johnny Walker has all the talent in the world. He's fast. He hits hard. Those are really all you need. You just need cardio and skills to back it up. So Take down defense. Exactly. So if he did stay with TriStar and actually stayed there for not just one year, not just two, three, four years, like let Faraz Ahabi really try to train you, really teach you a lot that he knows, and then we might see better uh, performances in the future. But what he's doing right now just isn't working. So that was the second week. Then there was a third week. He had Howie and Paiva, who we've seen have success yeah. at Flyweight. Like he lost his first two. He's ranked. It was weird. And then he comes out. And that's not to say that out of those two fights, they were bad. They weren't terrible. One of them, his uh, his eyebrow popped. And there's not much you can do. But he looked good in his last fight. Gets a win there. He also he had... knocked out in his last fight against uh, uh, the guy who fought Figueiredo. Almost certain. He won his last my fight bad. over Mark De La Rosa, he and he knocked him out. Oh, I'm boy. So wrong. Yeah, man. Oh, doesn't know, doesn't know the lowest lot, of the flyweight division, but still. Venetius Mohea, it didn't go all that well. John Allen, uh, who he fought, was supposed to be picked up, and then we haven't really seen him. You also had Tiago Moises, and you had Luana Carolina Souza getting contracts. Now, the one thing I want to say, again, Howie and Piva getting ranked, it's not that it's super easy, but it's going to be easier at flyweight because no, you don't have a lot of people. But if I could rank all these seasons of Contender Series, for me, I would go Season 1 is my number 1, Season 2 is my number 2, Brazil is my number 3, and Season 3 is my number 4. Because out of Brazil, we've had a lot of fighters signed, and I know it was only three weeks with some of the best of the best talent in Brazil or out of Brazil. But we've had a lot of people making an impact out of that season versus Season 3 where, again, season uh, the Brazilian season happened in 2018, so it's been a slow burn, whereas we just had Season uh, 3 of just your average contender series and we haven't been able to see a lot of that competition but it's just name value off of brazil season two and season one that have done it for me would you agree with that ranking the only difference i would do is i'd have number two so i'd go uh two one brazil and then three is my ranking i I do agree with you i think one and two are the two best i just have them ranked a little bit differently i just feel like the volume of season two is a little bit better than the talent of season one but season one just with jeff neal and sean o'malley those are the two guys who i really do believe regardless of everyone else and City Yusuf's kind of in that category, but he's he's not really there just yet. Those are the two that I can honestly see maybe one day fighting for the title. And that's about it. And again, that's my problem with two Snake Contender Series as a total. But it, it, season three, there's a big reason why we don't have enough to go off of. None of these guys have really fought that many times since their season. So the crews really haven't been able to grow that much since uh, their debut, if you will. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of fighters in there who are going to go on and have really great careers. It's kind of too early to tell right now. But right now, season one or season two, the best. Three, the worst. And Brazil, there is some quality fights. Yeah, okay. So that that's going to be a lot to digest for you. We we went through our off of our previews from last summer, offering a bit of an update from our perspective now and going through week by week and looking at everybody that was signed, all the contenders there. So there's a lot to digest. Maybe you want to watch this in a couple of different parts. And I'm telling like you this. the Irishman. I'm telling you this at the end. Yeah, maybe you need a little bit of a break and then you get back to the last half hour. Um, but in terms of this, yeah, there's all sorts of contenders. A great question asked by Lee Mori. I know we took it in a little bit of a different direction. It's one of those things that we've answered a couple of different times in a couple of different ways. So we wanted to kind of go this route today. And I know for a fact, it was one of the things that I talked about with John Franklin over on early stoppage, which I say over on early stoppage, 
It's going to be a Fight Night Pick Show, and it's going to be coming out later on this week. We're going to be taping it tonight. We've got a special episode uh, coming out, and it's going to be a fight or early stoppage throwback edition, the first 20. So we're going to be talking about the first 20 years of the UFC from 93 to 2013, and then we're going to get into the rest of it in a second episode. But we've got a lot planned for Fight Night Picks. Really appreciate all the questions for Perry and Counter. And Matt, we've got a lot of stuff we uh, do. coming There's up. A lot going on. Even if there's no fights, and we're fighting eight picks, we don't have to just don't worry, pick fights. Sean Jones still gonna get in trouble. We are picking your questions, so we really appreciate everybody tuning in. If you want to throw us questions, make sure you go down in the comments below, or you find us on Twitter and Instagram at Craig Allen FMP, at Matt Allen FMP, or at Fight Night Picks. I know a lot of people have asked, where can we find you? Where can we submit questions? You can find us there as well as in the comment section. So really appreciate everybody tuning in today. And as we always like to say, Matt, with Fight Night Picks after a really long episode, let's, let's get, get into, into it. it.